with me, Acts 24. Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us all here to, to, to receive this lesson. I pray that you would open our hearts and ears to, to hear what, what is going to be said. Moreover, I, I don't, I ask that what I would say would just be really clear because what I have to say is a little bit difficult. It could be, conf, you know, confusing. And I ask that you, you would give me the ability to, to deliver this with as much clarity as, as your spirit can provide through me. Father, um, I pray that you continue to build unity and love in this, in this fellowship. That you'd help us lead spirit-led lives this week. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> so the importance of this chapter. Um, let's, let me just back up for a moment. What we have here is in the book of Acts, there are times in the book of Acts where we go through many years. It just says, and then a few years passed. Okay? And so, um, but in this passage, in this area, we see a really detailed look of something that happens over a period of 12 days. The last three chapters were about 12 days. And when I say that, you know, in, the, in other parts of Acts that uh, in a few verses they could say, and then five years passed, to give three chapters to this event must mean it's a pretty important event. And we're really at the climax of this event because at the end of this chapter it says, and then two years passed. Two years pass, and Paul's in prison. So there's a lot of um, drama that's about to unfold. The climax of this drama uh, occurs right here in Acts chapter 24. Now, in the previous chapters, what had happened? Paul had gone back to Jerusalem. It had been prophesied that if he were to go back, that they were going to chain him. That's exactly what happened. And then Paul was subsequently told, but don't worry about it, because I'm going to send you to Rome. You're going to witness about me to the people in Rome. So Paul knows this is coming, and he's being bold and brave, and he's doing what he knows he's supposed to be doing. But when he went to Jerusalem, the, the leaders there said, look, the Jews think you have certain thoughts about the temple, that you are you're really trying to tear down the, the Jewish religion. So what we're going to have you do is we're going to have you go through the rites of purity so you can show that you're still, you're not a, an iconoclast, okay? You're not a person who tries to tear down uh, religion, okay? You're, you're, we, can, we want to live in harmony with, with our Jewish unbelieving brothers and sisters. But when he goes to the temple, there are some Asian Jews there. That's what the passage actually says here. That uh, what they did is they, is they started a riot. And what happened is this commander, Lysias, had to come uh, put down the riot. And... Um, uh, he had to capture Paul. He's about to flog Paul. And Paul's like, I'm a Roman citizen. Are you sure you're supposed to be doing this? And Lysias is like, uh-uh. Maybe I shouldn't be. So what he does next is he's like, but we got to get to the bottom of what just happened here. So Lysias does the next best thing. He hauls Paul before a council of the Jewish Pharisees and Sadducees, before the high priest, Ananias. And Paul's supposed to give an account of what he's doing in the temple. And Lysias there is watching. The commander Lysias of the Roman guard is there. He's watching this. And what happens is Paul says a few things. He gets struck on the mouth for saying he has a clear conscience by command of the high priest Ananias. Paul loses his temper and says something mean about the high priest. And then someone says, you realize it's the high priest, right? And Paul said, oh, I didn't. Uh, I shouldn't have done that. But you know what? Paul then says, but you know what? This situation just got out of hand. I got to get myself out of here. So he says something kind of clever. Paul, previously being a Pharisee, knew that he could start an argument anytime the resurrection of the dead was brought up, a, theo a theology that the Sadducees and the Pharisees disagreed on. Bitterly, they disagreed on it. And what happened to be the case was in that council, half of it was Sadducees, half of it was Pharisees. They were all in agreement about persecuting Paul because Paul's this guy who's telling Jews to live differently, that was bad. But when it came to the resurrection, they began to bitterly feud. And what happened is, is, is uh, uh, chaos broke out. Paul was about to get killed because the, there was an onrush. Lysias grabs Paul, violently takes him out of there, writes a letter to Felix and says, Felix, I don't know what to do about this anymore. I don't know what's going on. I suspect that what's happening here is there's some sort of issue that has to deal with their religion. The thing is, I, I was just informed that, uh, that there are people tomorrow who are waiting to kill Paul. They're, they're going to they're gonna ambush me. 
and they're going to try and kill Paul. So I'm sending him to you right now. And so Paul was taken from Jerusalem to Caesarea early in the morning, maybe late at night. He was taken to Caesarea to wait trial by Felix. And what Felix then does, or excuse me, Lysias does, the commander does, is he says to the Jews the following day, you need to go see Felix. I took, I took Paul there last night. You need to go give your trial. Uh, you need to give your accusations before Felix. And so that's kind of where this picks up. It's been five days that Paul's been uh, imprisoned in Caesarea waiting trial by Felix. And we're waiting for the Jews to show up to give accusation against Paul for why Paul uh, is in big trouble. Now, I started with saying the importance of this passage. The importance of this passage comes down to this. What we see is in this passage that Jesus, Jesus' prediction about what would happen to his disciples occurs in this passage. Jesus um, said, Behold, I am sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves, so be as wise as serpents and innocent as doves. And that's the key part for us today. I need to show you that what Paul was doing here in giving his case was he was being as wise as a serpent, but as innocent as a dove. This is a, this is a perfect example of how to do this. When stakes are high, when liars are present, this is how to do it. Jesus continues by saying, beware of men. That's interesting. It's men you got to watch out for. It's not the devil. It's not the demons. It's not weird philosophies. Although those are warnings given elsewhere, Jesus is concerned about men. Don't give your trust blindly to men. Men. What, what men will do is they'll deliver you to courts. They'll flog you in synagogues. That's churches. They'll flog you in the churches. Um, and you will be dragged before governors and kings for my sake, to bear witness before them um, and the Gentiles. And so Paul, if he knows about this passage, and I'm, I'm pretty sure he does, what he knows is that this is, his, this is what's happening, that he has a role to play here. He's supposed to give witness of Jesus Christ before the Gentiles and before the kings. Jesus finally says, when they deliver you over, do not be anxious about how you are to speak or what you are to say, for what you are to say will be given to you in that hour. For it is not you who speak, but the Spirit of the Father speaking through you. Okay, so that's Matthew 10, 19 through 20. So Paul doesn't know what the accusations will be when he shows up. The Jews are going to show up on scene five days. Paul is sitting in prison. He's wondering, what are they going to say? What was I doing that would cause them? Uh, that would give them cause to bring accusation against me. What's their case? How do I defend myself? What he has to do is he has to comfort himself with this idea that in the hour that he needs to give his defense, the Holy Spirit's going to help him out. That's the best that can be done. Okay, so we're going to start with uh, verses 1 through 2. And after five days, the high priest Ananias came down with some elders and spokesmen, uh, one Tertullus. They laid before the governor their case against Paul, and when he had been summoned, Tertullus began to accuse him, saying, Since through you we enjoy much peace, and since by your foresight, most excellent Felix, reforms are being made for this, for this nation. So let's talk about the actors. Let's talk about the characters in the story a little bit. Ananias. Why was he there? Ananias is the high priest. Why was he there? He's 80 years old. He's got to travel 60 miles. They hired a lawyer. Could he have not sent a proxy to go with the lawyer? There were other Jews present. Why was the high priest there? That's a little bit ominous because the high priest has a lot of political clout. The high priest standing in that courtroom of a Gentile ruler would have been very uh, suspicious. It would have been unorthodox. It would have been strange to see the high priest in Felix's courtroom. Subsequent to this, the high priest would actually have to go do rites of purification for stepping into a Gentile, uh, into a Gentile home. So this is quite the statement that's being made here. Um, it appears to be very personal. Um, it, it seems to suggest that what was happening here is that the high priest is making it very evident by his very presence that Paul is considered to be a threat of the highest order. Let's talk about Tertullus for a moment. 
This was a hired Roman lawyer. The Jews hired a Roman lawyer. So they don't have a lot of experience going before Gentile rulers. And if you recall the time they took Jesus before a Roman ruler, Pontius Pilate, Pontius actually ruled in favor of Jesus, said that I don't find anything guilty about this man. And they nearly weren't able to crucify Jesus. So they weren't taking any risks here. They wanted a Roman uh, lawyer to have the most effective argument. And what's interesting is what is delivered is a message, a political message, right? What wasn't given was a lot of evidence. What wasn't given was, was an argument and, and, and um, incriminating testimony wasn't given about Paul, okay? And we're going to read that in a moment. What's given is a political message. Hey, by your foresight, because you're good at seeing things, we have, you have been able to bring peace to this nation. What's the hint here? We hope you can see another opportunity to bring peace to this nation. It's a political message. Um, now, history tells us some interesting things about Felix. Interesting things that should tell us that what the lawyer just said was a total lie. The Jews were not impressed with Felix's ability to bring reform to the nation and peace to the people. Let's talk about Felix for a moment. He'd been there for nine years as a ruler. His brother Pallas, who's kind of famous in Roman history, was a friend of Nero, the emperor of Rome. Now, Pallas had gotten his, his brother, um, who was a slave. Paul, Pallas was also a slave. These men were freed by Claudius. And he got his brother a job, a pretty sweet gig, as ruler in Palestine. So he was there by, by Nero's dispensation. And Felix wasn't an especially, he was not an especially um, talented ruler. Okay? Uh, Tacitus, a Roman historian, said about Felix, with savagery and lust, he exercised the powers of a king with the disposition of a slave. He exercised the powers of a king with the disposition of a slave. Drusilla, for example, who is mentioned later, is Felix's third wife. Felix later will be trying to get a bribe from Paul. And just, and we read from the Roman historians that just previously, uh, Felix had killed 30,000 Jews at the Mount of Olives who were being led by an Egyptian who claimed to be the Messiah. This was just recent. And what's so interesting about that is in the previous chapter, when Paul tells Lysias, the commander, hey, I'm a Roman, you shouldn't be flogging me. Lysias says, well, at least you're not that Egyptian we're looking for. Yeah. The Egyptian was that Messiah who led the 30,000 people to their deaths. And what was so tragic about that is, is that uh, Felix took no prisoners. He killed them all. You I mean, they were done fighting, but that wasn't good enough for Felix. He killed them all. There was no mercy. That's how Felix was. And Jews didn't like that about him. He'd done some other missteps, some other mistakes. And in two years from now, Felix, it'll read in this chapter, at the end of the chapter, at the end of two years, Felix is ousted from his position. And we read from the Roman historians, the reason Felix was ousted was the Jews went to Nero and said, you got to get rid of this guy. And that's what happened. The only reason Felix wasn't punished, well, a couple reasons. One, Pallas, his brother, was still buddies with Nero. But secondly, it reads at the end of this chapter that Felix left Paul in prison, what? As a favor to the Jews. So you see, Felix is, is, is real concerned, real concerned about the Jewish political factor in his ability to rule. And that, that would have been true um, of all rulers in Jerusalem in Samaria, in Palestine, the Jews, being, um, the Jews being in favor of you was the only way you could maintain your rulership of that area. Okay, so let's move on, all right? So now we're going to move on to verses uh, 3 and 4. We're going to hear a prosecution. We're going to hear the actual case. So, we'll just get there. In every way and everywhere, we accept this with all gratitude. But to detain you no further, I beg in your kindness to hear us briefly. 
So the reason we're not going to continue venerating you, Felix, we could go all day talking about how great you are, but we're going to just we're going to move swiftly not to detain you, right? Okay. Verses 5 and 8 through 8. For we have found um, we have found this man a plague, a pest, one who stirs up riots among the Jews throughout the world and is a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. He even tried to profane the temple, but we seized him. By examining him yourself, you'll be able to find out from him about everything of which we accuse him. The Jews also joined into the charge, affirming that all these things were so. So I read through verse 9. Um, so they had three accusations. One, that Paul creates riots, which is sedition. Sedition in the Roman Empire was punishable by death. He desecrated the temple, which is, by the way, a change in the original charge brought against Paul. See, the original charge in a previous chapter was that Paul had brought someone else into the temple who desecrated it. Now they're saying Paul desecrated it. Well, Herod had, in previous years, given permission to the Jews to kill whoever desecrated the temple. So again, punishment by death would have been uh, what should have been called for here. And then finally, he's starting, he's starting new religions. Now, Rome was okay with new religions, but they still licensed certain religions and unlicensed certain religions. The licensed religions were allowed to kind of not worship Rome. They were allowed to do things a little differently than everybody else. The unlicensed religions had to continue to offer, uh, um, give offerings to, 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 to the emperor who was considered a god. They had to um, perform the various rites of Roman worship, right? So you could have your religion, but you had to also be a part of the Roman religion. That's how that worked out. Unless you were a licensed religion, then you had certain special dispensations. You were, you were given certain exceptions. Okay. But the point is, you remember that this guy is starting a new heresy. He's starting something that could be dangerous. And that Egyptian you're hunting, this man could turn into that. So you got to watch out, Felix. We think he's dangerous. All right, so let's move on. The, when the governor had nodded to him to speak, Paul replied. So let's stop just real quick. Notice... First of all, no evidence has been brought in. No testimony has been brought in at this point. What they're asking is for Felix to become a prosecutor, right? Felix is supposed to be a judge. He's not supposed to be a prosecutor. They're asking for Felix to do something that is unusual. And when there's no evidence available, they're asking, Felix, you go find evidence. You go find evidence for why this man's a pest. What we're starting to see here is that Felix says, oh, I see. What's, on, what's been put out for me is an offer of political favor. All I have to do is prosecute Paul and find him guilty. Okay, well, let me hear some facts, and we'll begin the prosecution. Okay. Um, Paul's defense. Let's start reading 9 through 10. Knowing that for many years you have been a judge over this nation, I cheerfully make my defense, says Paul. You can verify that it is more than 12 days since I went up to worship in Jerusalem. So the first thing that Paul says is, I, I, I'm not worried about, I'm glad you're the judge. See, by reputation, I know that you'll understand what I'm about to talk about. But by bringing up Felix's reputation, he also somewhat invokes the man's loyalty to Rome. How so? Well, because a man's reputation in being a good judge, a fair judge, was also based upon the mandate that he had from Rome. He had to have a certain reputation. Otherwise, his reputation would get back to Rome. Okay. But Paul is really just glad. I don't think he's being flatter. He's, he's giving flattery. He's just stating, I am glad that you'll understand what I'm talking about. Because my entire case depends upon Jewish customs and the specifics of what happened here. So let's keep reading, 11 through 13. You can verify this no more than 12 days since I went up to worship in Jerusalem. And they did not find me disputing with anyone or stirring up a crowd, either in the temple nor in the synagogues or in the city. Neither can they prove what they are now bring to me. So first of all, no evidence. Have we, do we see that yet? No evidence for this stuff. They didn't give any. But next, you can verify my activities. 
I was there. Okay, I've been, <laughs> it was 12 days that I went to Jerusalem. Five of those days, I've been in your prison. That gives seven days. In seven days, am I really uh, stirring up revolt against Rome? Is that even, in seven days, is that even possible? So what he's done is he's done harm to the first accusation. That Paul was in Jerusalem stirring up revolt against Rome. How is that even possible? And notice that the stronger that Paul's case becomes, the stronger that it becomes, that there is no evidence for what they're saying, the more evident it will be that if Felix finds in favor of the Jews, it will not be because uh, it, there was a strong case against Paul. It will become more and more evident that if Felix finds in favor of Paul, or excuse me, the Jews, that Felix is doing someone a favor. So Felix is thinking about this. He wants to hear the case. All right, so let's keep reading, 13 through 18. Neither can they prove to you what they now bring against me, but this I confess to you, that according to the way which they call a sect. Now, that's what Christianity was called before it was Christianity. It was called the way. And how do we know that? Or where did that come from? It, it most obviously comes from the fact that Jesus said, I am the way the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. So initially, in the first few years of, of the existence of, of Christianity, it wasn't called Christianity. It was called the way. And Paul says, they call it a sect, but I'm going to tell you something different. I worship the God of our fathers, believing everything laid down by the law and written in the prophets. Okay, so everything that's written down I agree with having a hope in God, which these, the, these men themselves accept, that there will be a resurrection of both the just and the unjust. So I always take the pains to have a clear conscience toward both God and man. Now, after several years, okay, so I'm going to stop there. All right, so Paul is saying everything that they claim to believe in, I believe in. Okay? Um, and it's because I believe in a resurrection at, uh, from the dead that, that I always try to have a clear conscience before both God and man. Now, this idea of conscience is going to be the most important part of my entire lesson today. Conscience. Paul is, is saying he has a clear conscience. Now, if you remember during the council, I already mentioned this already, but I'll say it again. During the previous council where he's being accused by the Jews and, and Lysias had a the commander had to come and grab him and carry him out. What got Paul hit in the mouth? He said, I have a clear conscience before God. And the high priest said, hit that man in the mouth right now. So what does Paul do? Well, the high priest is standing over there. I think he deliberately says it again, knowing the high priest can't do anything about it. I have a clear conscience. What about you? So Paul says, because I have a conscience, because I know I'm going to be judged before God one day after the resurrection, I always take pains to have a clear conscience before God and man. Now, after several years, I came to bring alms to my nation to present offerings. While I was doing this, they found me purified in the temple without any crowd or tumult, but some Jews from Asia. Okay, so I'm going to stop there. He's going to go on to say some Jews from Asia should be here giving testimony. Okay, but what Paul has basically said is, is, my behavior is this. I believe everything that's written in, in the prophets. So this is not a new religion. Okay, so the first accusation of starting a riot, not possible. He's been there for seven days. Or a revolt. Um, number two, why was I gone and came, and, and came back? Well, I came back with gifts. This would have been verifiable. But moreover, if he's a Jew, he should be in the temple getting purified. That's what Jews did when they left the Jewish nation and went out to Gentile territory. They came back and they were purified. And not, not only that, but to be purified, you would have received a token, okay? And when I was in Israel, I saw one of these. This token was given to you if you, it was proven that you had been purified and you were ready to go into the temple. They'd give you a token. You could show a guard before you passed into the temple. So Paul's saying, I have verifiable evidence. I was purified. That's why I was in that temple. And they have no evidence, no countervailing evidence that, 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 that that's not true. Um, 
And why did he leave the country and why did he come back? To go get gifts. Not to spread dissension, not to spread revolt, but to get gifts for the poor. Again, a confirmable fact. But here's the thing. Paul's behavior so far matches up with his stated beliefs. But one thing he has to talk about is why, why then a riot? You just seem like a Jew like everybody else. Explain to me why there was almost a riot. Well, so Paul says, but some Jews from Asia, they ought to be here before you. I'm in verse 19. They ought to be here before you to make an accusation. Should they have anything against me? Or else these men themselves say what wrongdoing they found in me when I stood before the council. So here's what he's doing. Again and again, he's saying no evidence. They have no evidence for what they're claiming. First of all, who are these Asian Jews? Felix hasn't been told about them. Where's their testimony? Why is this missing third party not around? What were their motives? They were involved in the riot. Why aren't they? Um, wh- what were, <laughs> why can't we figure out what they were thinking? Okay. And this, by the way, would have been confirmable by Commander, the Commander Lysias. Commander Lysias was there at the riot. And Commander Lysias was warned about men in waiting. So what Paul's pointing out here is that there are motives we don't know about, and we don't know about these motives because those men, they're not here. This seems very suspicious, I'm sure, to Felix. Oh, I see. So your accusers are hiding something. They're hiding a group. There's nefarious things that happening here, and we don't know what's really going on. Okay, but then Paul brings up the other embarrassing fact. I've already been before a trial. Let's, how'd that go? What do they find out that, that, that was so wicked that they had to pursue me all the way over here? Paul knows that nothing can be said because Lysias, the commander, was there watching it. He saw the whole thing. And Paul said, look, if there's anything wrong with what I did, it's merely because I might have said it is with respect to the resurrection of the dead that I am on trial before you this day. So what he has finally done is he has finally pointed out he's not a religious sect. Um, he's not a new heresy. The reason a riot broke out uh, is perhaps because of some motives. We can't be sure of what it is. But I have legitimate religious disagreement with our religion, okay? And I wasn't starting a riot. And by the way, I was purified before I went into the temple. That's verifiable. So there was no desecration. Uh, there was no sedition. There was, um, there's no heresy. There's no heretical sect. It's just a legitimate theological discussion. So where's the evidence that I'm a bad guy here? All right, well. It's such a strong case that at this point that Felix, who was offered political favor by the Jews, who brought no evidence to accuse Paul, um, uh, the case is so strong that the first thing Felix does is he dismisses everybody. Let's keep reading. Verse 22, Felix having a rather accurate knowledge of the way, as in Felix knew about Christianity. He knew quite a bit. He understood the religious... uh, disagreement. The specifics of Paul's case were made sense to him. So he put off the Jews saying, when Lysias the tribune comes down, I will decide your case. And this is smart. He can confirm a lot of Paul's, um, a lot of Paul's facts by talking to Lysias. Then he gave orders to the centurion that, that Paul should be kept in custody, but have some liberty, and that none of his friends should be prevented from attending his needs. So right away, does, does Felix give any room for the Jews. No. And this must have really angered the Jews. He knew it would. That's why he put off. That's why he deferred judgment. Just say, this guy's innocent. Would have created some havoc. And the whole reason this was happening, this whole courtroom thing, was because there was nearly a riot. And, And Felix knows that there's nefarious schemes at work. So the best thing he can think of to do is to put off judgment. Because if he judges, there could be a riot. But on the other hand, Paul's case is so strong, he cannot take the Jewish offer of political favor. He would have become a patsy. His reputation as a judge would have been ruined. So after some days, let's keep reading, verse 24, Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, who was Jewish, and he sent for Paul and heard him speak about faith in Jesus Christ. And as he reasoned about righteousness and self-control and the coming judgment, Felix was alarmed and said, go away for the present. 
When I get an opportunity, I will summon you. At the same time, he hoped that money would be given to him by Paul. So he sent for him often and conversed with him. When two years had elapsed, Felix was succeeded by Portius Festus. And desiring to do the Jews a favor, Felix left Paul in prison. Okay, so Felix didn't get ahead here. He had an opportunity for political favor. He turned it down. He was left with a problem that he didn't know how to remedy without a riot. But Felix was a profiteer in his position. And so he was going to try and find some way to make this work in his favor. And the best way to do that was to try and get a bribe from Paul. Now, Paul wasn't in it for bribes. This must have really vexed Felix. Okay? And just previous to this, the first uh, instance that he invites Paul in for a, for a discussion, what does Paul do? Man, he goes straight for the jugular. He goes straight for this man's reputation. He talks about uh, temperance, self-righteousness, judgment. And Felix is so convicted by his conscience that he has to dismiss Paul. He's trembling. And he has to dismiss Paul. He has to let Paul go. So you remember how I said conscience was going to play a big role in this passage? Well, Paul begins with using information that would appeal to the conscience of Felix and would prick the conscience of, of his accusers. And then after he's, the, the trial is over, does Paul refrain from touching the, the sensitive conscience of Felix? No, he's very bold. He's very bold. You know, conscience... Conscience is a difficult thing. Conscience can really hurt. It can really hurt. Um, let me tell you something that uh, Mark Twain once said. Mark Twain said the following. He said, if I had the remaking of man, if I could remake a man, the man wouldn't have any conscience. It is one of the most disagreeable things connected with a person. And although it certainly does a great deal of good, it cannot be said to pay in the long run. It would be much better to have less good and more comfort. Still, this is only my opinion. I'm only one man. Others with less experience may think differently. They have a right to their view. I only stand to this. I've noticed my conscience for many years, and I know it is more trouble and bother to me than anything else I started with. Mark Twain's not a big fan of the conscience. The conscience can be real troublesome. So what is the conscience? Well, the conscience, mean, con means with, and science means knowledge. Conscience means with knowledge. With knowledge of what? Well, Paul tells us in Romans 2.15 that the law of God is written on people's hearts and is the conscience that tells people that the law of God is there. You knew. You knew what was right. You knew what was wrong. And what it does is it accuses people it accuses people of knowledge of what is right and wrong. It gets after them. It bothers them. One of the things about, that's interesting about the conscience is that it, uh, it, is, it only works through the use of information. So, for example, let's say my buddy Brian asks me to go pick him up at the airport on Tuesday. At least that's what I think. Tuesday night comes, I realize I forgot to pick up Brian at the airport. I give him a quick call. I say, Brian, I'm so sorry. I feel terrible. I, did, I forgot to pick you up at the airport. Brian says to me on the phone, though, to my great relief, it wasn't Tuesday. It's Wednesday you're supposed to pick me up. Oh, thank goodness. <laughs> I felt terrible there for a minute. All right, I'll make sure and pick you up tomorrow. And he's like, well, you better. Okay? Your conscience works on the basis of knowledge, circumstantial knowledge, knowledge about your circumstances. Am I, if I saw somebody that looked like he was a crook running away from the police or running away from the authorities, and I tackle him, I detain him, I might have a brief moment of, of doubt. Is this guy really guilty? Did I accidentally tackle an innocent bystander? Boy, I hope this guy's guilty. The only way I get relief is when the police come up and tell me, no, no, you got the crook. Thank you very much. He's a bad guy. Whew. Okay, thank goodness. Guilt. A guilty conscience can only be relieved when the information changes. Okay? So that's why when it comes to self-deception, 
What you're trying to do is to dumb yourself down. See, self-deception is something we use to get away from a guilty conscience. Conscience is so terrible and so painful that what we will do is we will lie to ourselves about what the facts are. We will conveniently forget some facts. We'll conveniently make up some other facts. And then you know what we'll do? Is we'll go looking for true facts that everybody agrees with that we can use to bolster our case. What I'm suggesting here, guys, is that we can use truth to deceive ourselves. That's the important point. We can use truth to deceive ourselves to get away from a guilty conscience. That's the, most, that's the salient point of my message today. Truth can be used to deceive yourselves and to prevent your conscience from working. Okay. Listen, listen to the first part of James 1, 22. Do not merely listen to the word of God and so deceive yourselves. Whoa. So even the word of God can be used to deceive yourself. It must be. He just warned us about it. Now, of course, I took that a little out of context. Not terribly. I'll continue. Do what the word of God says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do it, what it says is so, like someone who looks at his face in a mirror. You guys know the rest of this. I'm not going to keep going. I'll get to the very bottom part, though. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, who does it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. So the way to prevent self-deception from occurring, the way to, to, to not be a self-deceived person is to look into the perfect law of God and to live by it. Seems simple enough. But why do we deceive ourselves? Why is self-deception a thing? Here's why it happens. I want to do an evil thing. I want to do a thing I know is wrong. It's going to make me really happy if I do the evil thing. But in order to avoid the pain of my conscience, I have to deceive myself. I have to lie to myself about this. Okay? But if I've lied to myself about the facts, about the information, about the truth that the conscience could use to accuse me, And what I've done right away is I've not submitted myself to the law of God. I am in rebellion to the law of God. And so if you are a man or woman who, who abides by the law of God, you don't have to worry about self-deception. You are submitted to it. You're submitted to the law. You're not in rebellion. That's the only reason to be self-deceived is to live in rebellion so the conscience can't work. Even Satan will use the word of God to help deceive a person. Remember? Do you remember when, when Satan said to Jesus, go ahead and leap from the building. Show the world who you are. The scriptures say he will command his angels regarding, uh, regarding you that you will not touch your foot on a stone. Well, what does Jesus do? He responds with scripture. He responds with scripture. Do not test the Lord your God. So people, will, people, including Satan, the arch deceiver himself, will use Holy Scripture to deceive you. Do you see what I'm saying by you can use truth to deceive yourself? By conveniently forgetting some facts, by conveniently making up some untrue facts, and then by looking for every bit of truth you can find, you can successfully deceive yourself. All right, so my, my ultimate conclusion I'm trying to get to here is, why do we have to worry about the truth in deceiving ourselves or others? The reason for this is, if you read carefully Paul's trial, what you see is that Paul didn't give a lot of explanation for the accusations. I mean, for example, what does Felix think really happened? Does Felix think that Paul was just the victim of an unfortunate circumstance? No, Felix has to have a story in his mind that explains what happened. And I think the story probably goes something like this, although what I'm really trying to do is to get inside the mind of a man who's been dead for 2,000 years, so this is just a guess. But it goes something like this. Paul is a man, the Jews, who I dislike, 
and who have crazy religious ideas, Paul's a man who disagrees with them. And being rather bold about it, he obviously was the victim of what happened to him. Some Asian Jews, some, some zealots from outside the area, they wanted to come and impress the bigwigs. You know what they saw? They saw Paul, a man that everyone disagreed with. They saw Paul and they were like, I'm going to impress the bigwigs. We're going to crucify this guy. We're going to get this guy. And it's only because my commander Lysias stepped in, in and stopped the crazy Jews from doing what they were doing that Paul was spared, basically. That's what Felix is left with. Now, could Paul have gone to his trial and said something different? Could Paul have said, look, okay, uh, these guys, these Jews, all right, they're wrong. I w all the accusations are wrong. They're totally wrong, but I understand them. First of all, I have been involved in a lot of riots. It's true. Ephesus, Athens, elsewhere, I've been involved in a lot of riots. Now, I never start these riots, but I, when I'm there, that kind of happens. Okay, so I get it. You know, he could have kept on by saying, well, you know, there actually are a lot of differences between, uh, between Christianity and Judaism. There's a lot of differences. In fact, in the 21st century, we'll say that Judaism is a different religion than Christianity. Paul had to make it the same. Basically, he had to kind of equate the two. He had to say, but I'm the real Judaism. Whatever they believe is not true. I believe the law and prophets. Jesus Christ, it says, Paul would go into synagogues arguing from the law and prophets that the Christ had to be crucified, had to suffer. So he's saying, I'm more of a Jew than they are. But today we'd say Judaism and Christianity are two different religions. And so Paul could have said, yeah, you know, they're kind of right. We're really different from each other. And here's the last thing. Paul didn't desecrate the temple, but you know what? He said the temple's not necessary for worship anymore. That's kind of profane to a Jew. Jesus said, uh, there's coming a time soon. Will you not worship this mountain or that mountain? But you'll worship in spirit and truth. That basically means we don't need a temple to worship anymore. That's kind of profane to a Jew. It's pretty profane to a Jew. And so Paul could have said, you know what? I understand why they think I desecrated it. That they, they must think that I'm, it's pretty offensive for me to be at their temple when I say the temple's not necessary for worship anymore. Do you understand what I'm doing here? I'm giving facts, a story that agrees with the, with the Jews' story. It gives more explanation about what was happening, about their accusations. What I'm suggesting is Paul didn't do that for a good reason. And here's the principle I want us to walk away with today. When it comes to giving truth, Paul gave only the truth that would afflict a person's conscience who was self-deceived. It's Jesus said, this is why I speak to them in parables. Though seeing they do not see, though hearing they do not hear or understand, in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. You will be ever hearing, but never understanding. You'll be ever seeing, but never perceiving. For this people's heart has become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn and I would heal them. So why does Jesus speak in parables and not give a lot of explanation? Why is he nebulous? Why is he difficult to understand for some people? He says it's because of their calloused hearts. It's because of the hardness of hearts. It's because a person decided they wanted to do something evil. They hardened their heart. They deceived themselves. And then what? And then Jesus began to speak to them in riddles. Why? Because if truth can be used to deceive yourself, you should not help people deceive themselves with truth. This is the practical part of my lesson today. We all have friends. We all have friends that come to us for advice. I have a friend, he li he's living in a sinful relationship with a girl. He's like, we're in a bad way. Do you have any advice? Yeah, don't be in that relationship. But you know what sometimes I do? When people come to me, they're in sin. They are self-deceived. I feel kind of bad for them. I feel a little bit bad. You know what would make it worse? If I got their conscience after them. The conscience is a terrible thing. It hurts so bad. But because I don't want to hurt my friend, what do I do? I don't give them the truth that would cause their conscience to accuse them. 
I don't hurt the self-deception. You know what I do? I tell them things like, well, you know, God's got a plan. Or I might say something like, you know, if you ask for wisdom from God, God promises to give it. Oh, yeah, that's good advice. It's good advice. But what I don't do is I don't give, I don't give the message that their conscience needs to, uh, to, to uh, accuse them of breaking God's law. And how are they ever going to need Jesus Christ if they don't see themselves as a sinner in need of mercy from God? As a lawbreaker who needs a sacrifice to save them from their sins, right? By being a coward and not sharing with them that information, I am basically keeping them from reconciling with God. And by giving them truth that they can use to help maintain their self-deception, that I'm okay, that things are going all right, I have hurt that person. And so what do we see from Paul? We see that Paul, just like Jesus Christ, Remember when Jesus uh, in chapter John uh, 6 of John says, uh, you have to eat my flesh and drink my blood? This was just after he'd fed thousands of people with a few loaves of, fish, uh, loaves of bread and, and a few fish. And they said to him, well, now make manna call, come down from heaven and we'll believe you. But Jesus saw that they were self-deceived. They deceived themselves. He wasn't going to give manna from heaven, and he was furthermore going to try to afflict their conscience. See, because if, if someone had walked up to him after he'd said that and said, look, I don't, think, I don't think I can eat your flesh and drink your blood. That's crazy. That, would hurt. That's like, that doesn't work real well. But you know what? Jesus is like, I'm glad you said that because I've been looking for someone who is in touch with their conscience to tell them the truth. Let me explain the rest of what I meant by that. So why did Paul not give background? Because to give that background would have been to help those men, the high priest, who is the political leader, but also the religious leader of the people, more truth with which to deceive himself would have been uh, irresponsible. It would have been bad. So for us, what, is, what, is, what do we got to take away from this? That the truth that we share with people has to be calculated to prevent them from being self-deceived, to help them from being self-deceived. And we have to do this skillfully. You can't just give any truth you want. You have to skillfully give truth, like Jesus Christ did, like Paul did in this passage. Unless you do that, people can go on being self-deceived. They can look at the perfect word of God, and instead of doing it, instead of being submitted to it, they can use it to, to deceive themselves. And that's why we see a perfect example of Paul being as clever as a serpent and as innocent as a dove. He was not deceiving anybody. He was speaking truth that would afflict people's consciences, which is an example that we need to follow. Even though a conscience is a terrible thing, it hurts like the dickens, we do feel bad for our friends. But if we don't do it, how are they going to reconcile with the law of God? How are they ever going to see the need of Jesus Christ and his salvation? How are they going to ever be the kind of people who understand the life you live? life that you live by the law. Not possible. So that's what I have for you today. And uh, I'll just open a quick word, or I'll close in a quick word of prayer. Father, thank you so much for this time. I hope that everything I said was clear. Uh, it was very difficult, but um, um, I pray that your spirit would, would, would work uh, in people's hearts to teach them about um, how they too can think about the way in, in which they can more skillfully give the, um, the truth that, that other people need to hear to, to, to affect the conscience in them that allows them to remove themselves from their self-deception and confront them with the word of God, the, the truth, your, your law. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.